I would like to tempt your taste buds just a little bit. My mother was well known for her baking. She passed away last year, and our family gathered together, and great memories were always centered around mom's baking and her wonderful bakery goods. One of her specialties was a cream puff. Oh, those delicious cream puffs filled with a sweet, sweet pudding center. You know, you'd get that cream puff, and although the outside, that wonderful pastry was delicious, and though it was covered with chocolate, and that was nice too, it was getting to the center, cutting in or biting into that wonderful creamy center that was so wonderful. Have I got you hungry already? Those cream puffs were delicious, and so it was that as we were eager as kids and even as adults to snatch those desserts up, oh, getting to the sweet center was what was so important. Oh, to be in that center and to revel, to stay there, to lick up all that juicy sweet pudding and how wonderful it is. Sometimes she put a little raspberry in the center, and you got there like a special surprise, something unexpected. Well, this describes our spiritual journey and our spiritual desire. Oh, to be in the sweetness of God. Oh, to be so in the center of the sweetness of God, to be in that place, to find that all the whole journey of our life is to get to the goodness, to get to this very special place, to be in that centered space, because something wonderful always happens when we're centered in God. Now, we talk about it a lot. In fact, Reverend Dr. John Parn invited us this morning to center ourselves, suggesting that we take a particular posture, putting our feet on the ground, not clenching your teeth, uh, relaxing your shoulders, being attentive to your breath. All these wonderful things that help us to understand this relaxed position of being centered. Centering yourself then is that place where we calm those emotions, those cares of the day. You know, they can be so distracting. Conversations can even take us off into places where we don't always want to be and feel at perfect peace. Sometimes, even before service, I suggest that you kind of let go of conversations, of greetings, saying hello, conversations over coffee out in the lobby. Come in and begin to center yourself. Because releasing those distracting things, you know, it's nothing worse than as a pastor, uh, just before you're walking into the service, someone says, can I have two minutes of your time? Just, and those two minutes turned into 10. And those 10, and in that, I want to drop a bomb. You know, my life is falling all apart. Can you do something for me right now before the service starts in these next two minutes? I'm like, uh, I'm sorry, I can't really right now because my mind is on, what am I doing here? Oh, that's right, I'm speaking. Oh, I got to think about my talk. What am I going to share? You know, suddenly everything, those distractions come into our world and we lose sight of what are we here to say? What are we here to do? What are we here, most of all, to experience? So when we center ourselves, we're releasing all of these emotions. We slow down our mind and our breathing. The sense of calm, a sense of realization of God's perfect, perfect, perfect peace that's there for us. Where you can feel a lot more going on around and most importantly, what's going on inside of you. You begin to be aware of something greater within your life. All the exterior world and all of its distractions begin to be pushed away and you become centered in this is the sweetness of God. This is the goodness of God. This is where I long to dwell. This is where I long to be. And it's keeping our thoughts in this wonderful place of a centeredness that is so calming for the journey of our life. And you can practice this. Here's a good thing. You can practice any time of the day. How about when you're on Interstate 85, 75, 400, 285, whichever may be your favorite route, practicing that centeredness. When someone cuts you off in traffic, what's your first gesture? <laughs> what's your first word? What are those things that you may say? You know, that's taking you to a place that's certainly not of calm. That's certainly not a place where, where there's that perfect peace being experienced. And in America today, we're constantly hearing these news stories of road rage rising within our world, of people saying, you did this, you did that to me, I'll show you. We just saw in the news someone who was cut off, and a, a soap opera actor jumped out of his car, ran to the car and punched the guy, knocked him out, and four days later he died. Oh, what a traumatic response when we think of how we are not practicing 
being centered. Because we must realize that anything we do in this moment, however you, however you react, is not going to change the fact that someone cut you off in traffic. Any gesture, any word, any action, anything you may do. So what you can do is rest, be at peace, relax, make the driving experience more powerful and meaningful as you center yourself. Breathe. That's it. Relax. Rest. Who cares if somebody, in the great scheme of life, somebody cut you off in traffic. Somebody didn't lose their turn signal. Somebody drove too fast. Someone drove too slow. Someone didn't make their exit on time and swerved in front of you. In the great scheme of life, does it really matter? But here is your opportunity to discover what really does matter. That centered life. You know you're centered when you feel this calm and perfect peace in your life. You know that we're intended to feel this every single moment of our life? Wow, you can be calm, you can be centered at any moment of your life? That's right. You know how often sometimes we uh, wake up in the middle of the morning, in the middle of the night, and suddenly all of a sudden the mind kicks in and we begin to worry and stress and think about the cares of the day? But how important it is to know that this perfect peace is there and it, you can experience this calmness at any time. Because centering is more than just trying to calm the mind. Let's really get into it. It's not just a simple act of saying, okay, shut up, be still, you know, quiet everything down, get, take control of your emotions. It's something more than that. It's an immersion. An immersion into the sweetness of God. This is really the invitation for us, our lives. And it's so symbolized in the teachings of John the Baptist. Wait, John the Baptist? Aren't we known? No, we know John the Baptist. Isn't he the one who baptized in water? Isn't he the one who, you know, he went around inviting people to be baptized? Isn't that what we know and realize in Scripture or come to know, shall we say, maybe through our religious traditions? But what is this baptism? Baptism was meant to be an immersion. Do you know that baptism started even before John the Baptist, even before Jesus' time? It was an ancient tradition passed on in many different religious cultures. It was an idea that symbolized an immersion of releasing and letting go, an immersion into the old good, shall we say, immersion into the sweetness of God is what it symbolized, and a releasing of all other cares and how important it is. You know, as a pastor in the Pentecostal church, my former uh, upbringing, uh, you know, baptism was a big part of the church. And we were always taught as seminarians, you baptize and you immerse and you make sure they go all the way down as you're taking that person. You know, they hold their nose, they go back and you dip them all the way under. Then you hold them down until they promise to tithe. Then you release, then you let them go. Uh, you bring them up forward. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You know, and there's probably, oh, yes, I've been, I've been baptized. Yeah. But it was about that experience of immersion, of releasing and letting go. The scripture says, behold, all things become new. The old is passed away. That was the essence of the baptism experience because the ancients believed that the baptism needed to take place in running water, moving water, because the water was washing away and releasing this. And we get caught up and we think it's all about, oh, we need to release the sorrow of our sin and how bad we were and how terrible we are. And that's our baptism, our focus on our sorrowing and our shame. And, oh, we're releasing all of that to coming into a new life. It is about not your sorrow, but your celebration of awakening to who you are. It's a celebration of an immersion that says, I have released and I let go of everything else that I might experience my highest and best, that I might receive it to the very fullest and how important it is. For John the Baptist was a ministry of teaching the importance of change your thinking, change your mind. He was the precursor to Jesus. He was the one preparing the way, setting the course for understanding. Now his experience his teaching, his mode was, I want you to experience this through a ritual. And sometimes we learn best through ritual. Sometimes some sort of activity. We need a few rituals in our life that really ex express what is it we're doing. And so the ancients would say, yes, let's go to the river. Let's wash away those old thoughts, those old ideas, those old crazy beliefs, those limiting things. Let's get rid of them. 
You know, we might be singing, I'm going to wash that thought right out of my hair. I'm going to wash that man right out of my hair. Do you remember that commercial, those old days? Uh huh. Well, that's exactly what that baptism experience is. You're releasing it. You're letting it go through this wonderful experience of pouring into consciousness this dissolving power of the new thought, of the word, of the new idea, of the changed mind. You know, it changes you. It transforms you. When you begin to say, I was headed this way, thinking this way, and now I go this way, thinking this way. I was caught up in this belief, these crazy ideas that said, you know, I'm limited. It's not working for me. It's not possible. It can't happen. Healing is not mine. All those things. That's where we're missing the mark. And instead, we change our mind and we release that one. We wash that off. We release it. We let it go. And we pour into our body, into our mind, into our very thinking, our very essence, this wonderful new thought, this new consciousness. You see, that immersion requires a letting go attitude. A letting go attitude. One of the key things in our spiritual life is we got to be ready to let things, some things go. Let some things go, you know. I've had people who come to me with all kinds of beliefs and they say, you know, I had this belief. I grew up with it. It was grounded in me. It was founded in me. It was part of who I am. It doesn't work for me, but I'm still going to hang on to it. You know, it's this crazy belief I have, this crazy idea that says, you know, um, I need to suffer more for my spiritual life. And the more I suffer, well, the more saintly I'll be. And certainly my rewards will be greater if I suffer. So just let me do some suffering. How's that suffering working for you? Uh, not so good. Do you really like it? No, I really don't. Uh, do you want to suffer? Nah, I don't really care for that either. But you know what? I have to hold on to this belief. You see? So it's got to be this letting go attitude that says, wait a minute. I need to let go of some things that though I may have taught, or they may have been foundational, though they may have been part of my childhood, it's time for me to let go. Are you ready to let go of the Easter Bunny? Are you ready to let go of Santa Claus? Okay, no. How about the Tooth Fairy? Okay, anyone ready on that? Some of us, we've got to let go of some of these things that were beliefs. After a while, you know, you realize, wait a minute, they're not really there. They're not really foundational for us. So it's this letting go attitude that's part of it. And it's this thought of denial that says, this is not who I am. It's a denial. I am not that. This is who I am. And that's what I love about the story of Jesus' baptism. Because as he's immersed, he comes forward. Mind you, he told John the Baptist, I need to do this. John the Baptist said, you don't need to do this. No, I need to do this. I need to experience this ritual of letting go of any kind of hindering attitudes. It was a precursor to his miraculous ministry because he set his mind on course by letting go. And when he rose from the water, the scripture says in this beautiful metaphorical and symbolic way, a dove descended. Now, it didn't happen that there was a bird flying over just at the right time. That's not what it's about. That dove symbolizing that perfect peace, centering that perfect peace descending upon him. Symbolic of what was experiencing, what he was experiencing within. And from there, he felt the heavens open and heavens, meaning that higher understanding and consciousness that simply said very clearly, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Wow, what an immersion. What a difference. What a transformation. What a release. What a washing away of the old. And when we think about Jesus, we think about a life living as a Jewish child, living coming from Nazareth, a city where Scripture says, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? It's not a good city. It's not a cool place. It's a impoverished, impoverished place. It's not a place where all the happening hip-hop greatest artists are happening, coming out. It's not the trendy place. It's not the L.A. or Hollywood of the world at that time. It's not the place where you think superstars come from. You see, all of that embodies. Sometimes we, too, think we come from a place of low beginnings, simple beginnings, humble beginnings. Who are we? We're nothing. But then we realize within us this manifestation of this greatness that's been awaiting all along, but we have to wash away these old thoughts. 
to awaken this. That you're amazing. There's power within you. There's incredible intelligence within you. And you awaken it up and you realize, most of all, God is pleased. Now, that's a big revelation for a lot of us. Because we didn't grow up thinking God is pleased. We're thinking we got to please God. We think God's up there going, I already don't like you. And I know you're a troublemaker. And I know you've been bad. And I'm already struggling with whether or not I'm going to, you know, deal with you or not. And when I do deal with you, oh, it's going to be trouble. Uh, you know, you're going to suffer because we know all about you, don't we, everybody? Uh-huh. See, okay. So you think that's the kind of God we serve, don't we? We think about that kind of thing, that God is out there. And then when we awaken to this wonderful thought, wait a minute. The divine love, the source of all good, wants to tell you right now, I'm pleased. I'm pleased. I, I I just love you. I adore you. I see your highest and best. I see your potential. I see the good within you. You see, that's a powerful awakening to realize then. Too often growing up, we've not heard someone say, you can do it. You're amazing. You're great. How many of you watched the show, the movie, The Help? And the maid turns to the little child and says, what? You is important. You is beautiful. You is kind. You is important. Uh huh. I love those words. Such a moving scene within the film as this African-American maid tells this little white child struggling uh, in the home life and wondering why the maid's being sent away and all these challenges, but reiterating some powerful words that are transformational that sometimes we have not realized or awakened to. This is the immersion that we're called to live in. This is truly our uh, centering in our life. For being centered is to get to the center, correct? Being centered isn't out on the fringe. Being centered doesn't mean, you know, I'm way out. If you draw a circle and you're looking for the center of the circle, it's going to be in the middle, right? It's not on the edge. So when we're centering our lives, we're getting to the core of all the power of the divine. We're getting to that place and resting in it where it is rich and sweet and good. We often look at the center of things always that the best is there. Those gooey brownies and the center that's milk chocolate and all those kind of things. So you can see all these food analogies. I'm going to get you going uh, on an appetite here. But what we want you to do is have this appetite for the centered living, getting into this wonderful place where we're at the core and where I'm at the divine heart of God. That's our place that we want to dwell in where we belong. And for in that meditation, it brings us to this place, centered in meditation. Now, meditation is something that's really crucial for our lives that we haven't really embraced a lot in a lot of religious traditions. We offering different opportunities for meditation here at City of Light. There's sound healing and there's a Reiki program that offers you moments of meditation on uh, the first and third Wednesday. There are other opportunities for you, but we encourage you to engage in this. Where in this centeredness, you move into a realm of perfect rest and a lie. It's the being still and knowing God. For in that centered place, the scripture invites us to understand the truth. Take no thought. Take no thought about tomorrow. Take no thought about your worries. To go into a centered place, to be centered, to be in that perfect place, you don't take something with you. You don't say, oh, I'm going to center myself right now, and I'm going to take uh, six different problems, and I'm going to take your problems and your problems and your problems as well as my own. I'm also going to take some stress and worry. I'm going to add to it a little bit of fear and anxiety. Let's take with us some anger and unforgiveness. No, take no thought. For the journey. Take no thought with you. For that person is there who must leave everything behind. In fact, today's scripture text is inviting us to understand how to center. You may think it's Jesus' instructions, last minute clues to his disciples to say, now when you go off in ministry, we want to make sure that you go out. Don't take anything with you. But what he's talking about is this beautiful symbolism. When you journey, to the heart of God. Don't take anything with you. You don't need anything. You don't need it. Here's the beautiful thing about that. Scripture says he called the 12 together. He gave them power and authority. 
He sent them forth to preach the kingdom. And he said to them, take nothing for your journey, neither a staff, nor a wallet, nor bread, nor money. Don't even have two coats. Instead, know this. You are my refuge. God is saying, you say to God, you are my refuge. You are my fortress. You see how beautiful that is to understand that where we're going, uh, we must leave everything behind. We're going to the center, to the heart of God. We've got to leave cares, worries, stress. We're going to set that aside. Because where we want to be is this place of the very sweetness, the goodness where God dwells. Ever have somebody surprise you one day and say, hey, I'm taking you on a vacation. Have you ever had somebody call, call you up and say, I've arranged for everything for you? Oh, I had a very special friend who knew that I was going through all kinds of challenges several years ago and said, you know what? I've already made arrangements with the church, with your job, with everything. We're going away for the weekend. And I said, I'm going away for the weekend. And we're leaving right now. And I said, we're leaving right now? What are you talking about? I haven't even packed. i got to go home. And Where are we going? Is it a warm climate, a cold climate? I mean, what do I need? All these kind of things. And he says, don't worry. When we get there, whatever we need, it'll be there. We'll have it. We'll find it. What a powerful illustration of when we're coming to the heart of God. You don't need to bring a thing because whatever you need is going to be found right there. The presence of God will bring you all the answers to those challenges that you may have set aside. Oh, but wait, wait, wait. I need to go back and, and pack up some anger. Uh, I need to go back and get some of this stress. Yeah, uh, just a, a couple of outfits of worry and care. Come on. Could I not have to bring them and pack them in my bag and carry them with me? Can I just bring an extra something or other that says fear and uh, doubt and questioning as I go into being centered? You need nothing. Because everything that you will need, you'll find in that centered space in the divine presence of God. It's there. Beautiful Psalm 23rd. You're all familiar with it, but sometimes we read it and don't focus on it as it says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The beautiful psalmist of, is writing this very passage of this is the journey of our life. When we're centered in the divine presence, when we go into meditation, when we go into this wonderful place, you don't bring a thing with you. In fact, you never should bring anything with you. You should be just hands free, feet free, mind free clear and free, and allow the divine presence of God, the rod and the staff, to guide you and to comfort you. You see, in that place of centeredness, the rod and the staff, we sometimes lose sight of what that really means, but it's a great analogy for those who were shepherds in the old time. They knew what it means to, for a shepherd to have a rod and a staff. The rod is that of guidance helping to guide the sheep in the flock to go where to the green pastures and still waters. The rod was the rod of instruction. And the staff was that wonderful word that pulls you in. That staff with a little hook that will grab around that pulls you and draws you back into the place where you need to be of safety and security. Those rod and the staff were not there to beat the sheep, whip the sheep, punish the sheep, termite, torment the sheep. It was there to comfort the sheep. Simple tap with the rod meant, come this way. The water's over here. Come on, come on, come on. Tap this way. Come on, there's still waters. The, the green pastures that you need. Come on, it's over here. Come on, you can do it. The staff was there. Oh, whoa, whoa, you're, I'm going to pull you back in place. I want you to go in the right and perfect way. You see, that's the love of God. Not there to beat you. Not there to punish you. But in love to guide you and to comfort you. And how important we understand this. Now, here's the thing. When you're centered, oh, wouldn't it be wonderful to stay centered all day long? Well, you can. In fact, the scripture invites us to say, pray without ceasing. And you're thinking, oh, wow, how many prayers do I need to pray that I pray constantly and I never pray without ceasing? You know, I just finished six pages of prayers and seven pages of prayers and I'm going on to a book of prayers. And that's not what it's all about. That prayer is that communion with God. Being in communion without ceasing, never stopping. And you can do that. 
You can. As you continually invite this, your spirit, your consciousness, your thoughts to say, let me get back to God. You know how those people are always trying to interrupt you, tap you on the shoulder? Hey, come here. No, wait a minute. Let me get back to what I'm doing here. Have you had that in a phone conversation where someone's going, and you're like, um, you know, hey, let me get back to the things I'm doing, and let me get back. I'll talk to you a little bit later, right? Uh, so we know this concept of getting back. Let me get back to where I want to be, where I belong. So it is that we go to God in this wonderful way that we're saying, I'm going to get back to this sweetness. I'm going to get back to this divine presence. I'm going to stay there. And I'm not going to allow anything that is there to, to disrupt me or take me away. After all, let me say, when you are centered, what are you communing with? Problems or God? Because let me tell you this. If you're communing with your problems, you ain't centered. Mm -mm. You ain't centered. Because if you've gone into meditation and you brought your problems with you, that is not a centered space. Now, if you understand this, that you're there to commune with God, then you understand clearly that I need to bring nothing with me because everything is right there. So let me get back to that place where everything is found and all that I need is there. We find in this beautiful story in Acts chapter 2, this very story of the early church gathering together. After Jesus' death, they gathered together in an upper room, and there they began to pray with one another. And they began to, and I would like to say the word, center with one another. They spent 50 days, 50 days together, because I think they needed 50 days as a group, as a body, to come and clear everything out. You can imagine all the people coming together is Jesus' mother. She's in the room, and she's looking at those 12 disciples and said, Peter, where were you? Peter, come on, you know, could you not have been there for my son? Good Jewish accent there. Uh, could you not have been there? Peter, what are you doing? You know, and I'm upset with you, Peter, because you weren't there for my baby boy, Jesus, you know. And maybe New Yorker, right? New York Jewish? Okay, okay. Uh, so what we find is all these energies of disciples and said, wait a minute, did you think you were going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God? Hmm. You and your ego. Another one turning, wait a minute, weren't you the one who denied Christ three times? Hmm. Weren't you the one who, you know, we passed judgment on and thought maybe you were a prostitute? Uh, Mary Magdalene? Mm hmm. You see all of them gathering together in this one room. And what had happened is they began to spend this time centering, going to the sweetness of God, getting to the center, the heart of God. And when they did, they let go of their ego, their self, their own self-importance, their own issues, their angers, their hurts, their wounds. And then the scripture says, and the day of Pentecost happened, this great birth of the church, this wonderful experience happened when they were all in one accord, meaning all in unity, all in oneness all in the same thought in mind, common thinking. They began to this wonderful place where they began to experience this harmonious spirit of God. They understand this unity of being so filled with everything that is of the goodness of God and all the distractions of self were gone. And that launched the birth of the community of God. We may call it the church, but it's really the community of God beyond just sanctuary and temples and buildings. It was the birth of this true community of people of understanding of who and what God is. So what you want to do is learn to slip into the center of God, slip into the circle of God, this wonderful presence of God around you, in you, through you, around you, and always for you. And you want to slip into that center. Yeah, how many of you heard that phrase, slip into something more comfortable? Uh-huh. And that's what it is, slipping into something more comfortable, the divine presence, the goodness of God. How important it is that we understand this for Psalm chapter 91, verse 1 says, Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Whoever dwells, and this is a key thing, to stay centered is this is your dwelling place. 
this is where I live and I come from. I don't come from outside the center. I come from the center when I move into my world. So every day you begin, I am centered. I have slipped into the goodness of God. I am there in this wonderful place. I'm at perfect peace. And now when the world comes at me, I speak from that very dwelling place of where I belong. I belong centered in this good consciousness, awareness, and loving presence of God. So no matter what comes to me or at me, I am able to just speak the word of peace, the words of love, the words of grace, compassion, and forgiveness. For whoever dwells, stays, lives, exists in the very shelter of the Most High, the shelter of the divine, the shelter of the goodness, will rest in this shadow of the Almighty. Years ago, when I met my partner Robert, he was a great country dancer. We would go out country dancing two-stepping. I don't know if you ever know two-stepping, if you're familiar with or how to do it. One of the acts is two-stepping dancing is called shadow dancing. You ever shadow dance? You know, it's where the lead takes the partner and the partner stands right in front of the lead in the exact same position. The follower stands, puts his hand out. The lead stands behind, puts their hand out, and they're facing outward, not facing together. And they shadow each movement of one another. You shadow dance. And in that shadow dancing, you're learning the movement of the other person. You mimic them. You shadow them in every movement, every step, and every detail. It's a beautiful dance to watch. It's a beautiful dance to experience. It's moving in this oneness with your partner. Not each one moving separate, but the lead interpreting the follow, the follow interpreting the lead, and then this you move together in this beautiful dance, this country dance. I need my cowboy boots uh, to, to get going. And uh, you have this beautiful shadow dance that you're enveloped in the shadow. You rest in the shadow. It's truly a beautiful picture of this psalmist's passage that you rest in the shadow of the Almighty. And as God moves, you move. And as God loves, you love. And as God projects uh, peace and grace, you project peace and grace. And you move in this beautiful dance of life together. You mimic the mo mo movements of one another in such a powerful way that you're now seen as one entity dancing through life. So it is to understand the power being centered, being so in the stillness, to be in that divine presence. So today I invite you to center yourself, to release and to let go. Take nothing with you for the journey and going to the center, to the sweetness of God. Don't bring a thing, single thing with it. You don't need to bring anything because it's all going to be provided for you right there in the goodness of God. Oh, someone will still argue with me. Are you kidding? I need to bring this prayer request from my aunt. I need to bring this problem from my workplace. I, are you sure? When I go to God, I need to always bring my problems because I need to dump them and unload them. And That's another time. When you're centered in the divine, you need not bring a single thing, but you rest, you be still, you know, you experience, and you allow. So it is so it's important to discover this amazing oneness that's available to you for you to shadow dance with the divine every single day of your life and begin to understand the power of the centeredness in you. Oh, how sweet it is to be loved by you. That's exactly what it is. Oh, how sweet it is to be in the divine presence of God and to feel the loveness. You've gone to the center of that cream puff and you can taste it. You're now in the sweetness of the divine and feeling the love of God. Amen.